Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, Lord. Praise thy holy name. God, we thank you for your presence in our midst this morning. Father, you've been doing amazing things in our own hearts and minds this week, settling us just on the simple bedrock of your word, your spirit, your salvation, your covenant, Lord. And Father, it's our joy to walk in it. It's our joy and delight to call you Lord. And here we are before you again this morning to learn from you. Father, to just walk with you. To look into the mirror of God's word and allow our lives to be shaped and molded into your image. Father, thank you for such a time as this. Good refreshing showers, Lord, and we just worship you. Amen. Well, a hearty welcome to both local and visitors this morning. It's been a very refreshing time, especially for those that have been able to make it pretty much every night. God has been very good to us. His mercy abounding to all of us, speaking and ministering in a way that only God can. So I just want to extend a hearty welcome to everyone. This morning, I think for announcements, there is an offering box in the back, um, mostly for the local congregation or, you know, if anyone else would feel compelled, uh, you are welcome to put some money in there, but that is, you know, we're not here lifting offerings, trying to make money. We're, we're here to seek Jesus. We're here to draw closer and open up his word and just allow our hearts to be challenged, convicted, inspired. The Holy Spirit, when he has come, he will convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. And that's what's been happening here this week, and I thank God for it. So, is there any other announcements that need to be made? I know after the morning meeting, uh, Pete Newfeld will come up after the message this morning and give instructions for the fellowship meal. <laughs> But if there's, if there's nothing else for announcements that I'm missing, just raise your hands if I'm missing. Tony? Like Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Amen, brother. Yeah, let's be ready. Well, God moves in mysterious ways to mold us and shape us into his image. One of the things he's done for me is I went to preach at a visiting church a little while ago. Who here is from Berea? Is there anyone, anyone from Berea visiting this morning? Looks like they all have a beautiful time at home. Yeah, I was watching this morning. I was Oh, praise the Lord. Well, what happened was Kevin had asked me to preach there, and I got there and remembered that I had forgotten my notes at home. So I was stuck with my phone, and I begged permission from the elders before I did that. So I got up and started preaching, and, you know, I've always had a bit of an issue with men getting up and using their phones for notes and stuff like that. So here I am in a visiting church who's stuck with nothing but my phone, so I think God was trying to keep me from getting too lifted up in my own opinions, um, which he's very good at that. Oh, sorry, brothers. And so here I am preaching away. And I made a comment that I could not express how serious this was. My phone understood, hey, Siri, and said, you're going to have to open your phone for me to answer that or look that up. <laughs> this would be bad enough at home, never mind in a visiting church. So anyway, there's such a great bunch of brothers and sisters up there. They're so compassionate and merciful. They just laughed, and so I laughed with them. I have since turned that feature off on my phone. <laughs> so you will not be entertained with that this morning, I don't think. But you want to talk about the devil interfering in the meeting this morning, brother. Um, we can ask the sound guys if the devil's been trying to interfere in the meetings. <laughs> 
I think they're more keenly aware of it almost than many of the rest of us. It was like night after night, there was something going wrong. You know, something not working the way it was supposed to. But God has been faithful. We don't need good technology for the Holy Spirit to work. It helps. We don't have to have it. And this morning, I'd like to just share an opening thought with you. Now, we're going to have Isaac Redekop. Where are you, Brother Isaac? We're going to have Isaac Redekop come up and do a children's lesson. And I'm not sure where you want the children, brother. you want them just up here on the floor, or do you want them up on the stage? On the stage. So we're going to go 10 and under? Sure. So once I'm done, Isaac's going to come up here, and then the children 10 and under, you come on up to this on stage here, and Isaac's going to have a children's lesson for you. And then we're going to give Brother Jerry the time after that. And maybe before we do that, Tony, you can come up after the children's lesson and lead in a song. Sure. All right. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. There's some beautiful Beatitudes in there. It's when Jesus starts his Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says a lot of beautiful things. One of them was, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And we just got back from Bolivia a little while ago, and I was talking to a young man who had allowed the things of this life to take his heart away from Jesus. And so we're talking together, and, and all of a sudden he got quite emotional, and he's in tears. And he asked me, brother, how do I get back my love for the word? It just, it struck his heart that he was so cold and indifferent to the word of God. And he wept. And God says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But how do we do that? How do you hunger and how do you, how do you get a hunger for the word of God? How do you get a hunger for righteousness? I think about a lot of the things we've been hearing this week, just that simple application to the word of God. You know, just reading it, believing it for the very exact things it says. You know, we haven't had a lot of frills and gimmicks and fanfare. It's just been a simple word of God being presented. And do you believe what it says? You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Brother, I'm never going to read that again the same way. It's, it's changed me. And it's one of the things I've been so blessed with that the word of God is so simple. And it's simply believing. And you know the difference between the believing and the unbelieving? Whether they believed or not. <laughs> it is not rocket science. <laughs> it is so simple a child can understand. We either believe or we don't. We believe God can do something in our life or we don't. And when we believe, we act accordingly. But blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. Not maybe, but shall be. It's God giving us one of his laws, one of his established rules that he's not going to go back on. It's more than that. It's a promise from a God that cannot lie. That if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we will be filled. I'm not sure how many of you ever eaten a meal, and afterwards you, you kind of felt like you still needed something. You ate, but it didn't really satisfy. But when you come to Jesus, you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you're going to get a hearty steak meal. And you're going to walk away from God's table, and you're going to be satisfied. And the next time you feel that hungering, you know exactly where to go to have that hunger satisfied. I came to Jesus, and all my life long I had panted for a draught from some cool spring. But Jesus, he satisfies my longings. Through his blood, I now am saved. And he satisfies in a way that this world never can. He fulfills in a way that the world cannot. Because we are made in his image. 
and created in his image to fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that's the only way that that void ever gets filled is when we come and we fellowship with Jesus. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. My question this morning is, are we hungry? Did we come hungry this morning? Are we hungering? You know, when our brother gets up to preach the word, is our heart going to be on the edge of the seat? You know, some of us, you know, we get up there in years a little more and we like to sit back and just be comfortable physically. But where's our heart at? Where's the heart condition? I still sometimes find myself on the edge of my seat. I'm, you know, what's coming next? Is there hunger in your heart? And is that hunger for Jesus? What are we hungry for this morning? Because blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do we really desire righteousness? If we desire righteousness, we'll find it and we'll be filled. We'll be satisfied. Jesus doesn't leave you hungry after you've been at his table. You come to him and he satisfies like no other. Do we hunger to be with Jesus? Is there that love relationship we heard about last night? You know, where a young man gets a letter from his beloved and he can't wait to get alone somewhere and read it. I was so inspired by that thought. But what about the young man that just got married? And we have a number of them here. How many have gotten married this year? Young men. Can you all stand up? Yes, yeah, so no, just stand up. Yeah, we got one, two up here. Where else? Got Joey over there. We got one back there. Joey in back there. Um, quick question before you sit down. Is it hard to go home after work? <laughs> How many of you are actually excited if the boss says we've got an early day? Yeah, it's like, I'm out of here, right? All right, you can sit down. Thank you. Yeah, they, they can't wait to get home. I mean, it's just exciting. Everything is new. Everything is fresh. And let that be an exhortation to those of us that have been married longer already. You keep courting and dating your wife and don't ever let that fire go dim. Be excited to get home after meeting. They hunger for that fellowship with their spouse. And they can't wait to get home. Now, for those of you young ladies, young wives that just got married, can you stand up? See, most, it's typically in the mornings we pick on the young men. So, question for you. How many of you have ever looked at the time to see if he's coming home soon? Yeah, can you raise your hands up? Every single one. All right, you can sit down. <laughs> Why? Because there's a hunger. And there's only one thing that's going to satisfy that hunger. And that's when they're back together again. Yeah, they, they go and they work and they, they've got to, as men, we need to provide for our families. And it's a good and a right thing. You know, as a matter of fact, if any does not provide for his family, he's worse than an infidel, the Lord says. And so we have that carnal necessity to go out and make a living to provide for our families. But where's the heart? You know, where's the heart? Where, where are the heart strings? It's kind of like that elastic when you stretch it and you let it go to go whoop. And now when I think of, and two of these children are mine, by the way. Um, you know, when I, when I think about Jonathan, I think Becca in the same sentence. I think Sarah and I think Daniel in the same breath. Because they, they, they twain are one. And there's nothing that satisfies like the two being together. This is our relationship with Jesus. You know, it's not in vain that the scriptures in Ephesians references the bride and Jesus, and he uses the husband and wife analogy to illustrate it, because it is, it is the most perfect illustration and type we have on earth of Christ in the church. And so we as men were exhorted... And anyway, I'm getting off topic here. Um, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And I do love to preach on marriage. It's a beautiful subject. But well, let's keep going here. They love to be together because there's a hunger in their heart that only the other can satisfy. And there is a place in our hearts where Jesus Christ abides by his spirit and only he satisfies. And it's a sad thing when Christians start looking to the things of this world to satisfy. It's almost like we got bored with Jesus. 
just like the Jews. You know, we, we don't have really any criticism left for the Jews, do we? Because I think all of us in our Christian life can testify to times where we've allowed the things of this world to distract us from Christ. And Christ, in his ever-loving mercy, draws us back again and again and again. And he says, no, no, no. come fellowship with me. My ways are sweeter. Those roads, they lead to destruction. But Jesus Christ, he will lift you up into a higher place when we draw near and we fellowship with him and he satisfies. And we know he does. Right? Those of us that have tasted, Psalm says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And all those here born again this morning, we know that God satisfies. We know that when we take time to be holy, that there's a beautiful satisfaction in the inner soul that nothing else can replace. And we've sat in prayer meetings where the prayer meeting is over and there's just that, almost like a holy hush on the prayer meeting. And you're sitting there thinking, please, nobody say anything. <laughs> Everybody just, let's just quietly rest and bask in his presence for a while. And inevitably, you know, we're still in this body and somebody says something and it's almost like the, the mood changes and life goes on. I get it. But oh, to be with him. And then we look forward to that time again. When can we do that again? When can we have that close fellowship with him again? Do we hunger and thirst after righteousness, after those things which are right? We need to seek righteousness. You know, Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when we seek his righteousness, we will be satisfied like we've never been before. Because we're no longer trusting in ourselves, we're now trusting in Jesus Christ. Our hope, our confidence, our whole being is resting in Jesus Christ. Romans, the beginning work. This is the work of God in John. It says that you believe on him. And so to believe is our first work as a believer. It's putting our hope and our faith, our confidence, our trust in him. I'm not trusting in Muhammad. I'm not trusting in anyone but Jesus Christ. He is my hope. He is my confidence. He is my resting place. In Romans 4, verse 3, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. How does that apply? Well, we believe God. We go and we read the word. You know, and when somebody is under conviction and repentance, they want to come to Jesus. Well, how do I come to Jesus? I love going to Romans, for with the heart man believeth, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what happens if we confess our sins? It says he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If he has cleansed you from all unrighteousness, where does that leave you? Righteous. That is the only logical conclusion we can come to. But it's not our righteousness, it's his righteousness. And so we spend the rest of our days in humble thanksgiving and adoration at the feet of Jesus for what he has done in our life. And it's a beautiful thing to watch those that don't believe embrace the truth. And I remember praying with one of our children and, you know, she had prayed, surrendered, confessed, left her life at the feet of Jesus. And she finished praying, we finished praying, and we sat there and nothing had changed yet in her own, you know, her, her expression still looked the same. Nothing had really changed. And I, and I went to 1 John 1, 9 and I read that scripture. And I said, what did you just do? Well, you know, I surrendered to Jesus. Well, you know, in essence. And so, well, here's what Jesus said. Now, the choice is, are you going to believe him? And she sat there for a few seconds and she said, 
I, I believe it. You know, if Jesus said it, I believe it. And the transaction happened right there that quickly. It was established in heaven that another soul has entered the kingdom by faith. It's a righteous act. And that is the beginning of our walk of righteousness as the children of God. And we keep walking that way. The other day we heard, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord said, walk ye in him. And that's one of the verses that if it could be wore out, I'm going to wear that one out before I go home. Out of this earth, I mean. So, there's another verse in 1 John 3, 7, and it's in no way in conflict with the other scriptures that I read, but it says, let little children, let no man deceive you. And the potential here is for deception, because so many people, they like to separate, and they don't understand the new covenant is a walk with Jesus. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's communion with Jesus, and we're not delivered out of the new old covenant unto no covenant, but we are now in the new covenant. And Jesus says all kinds of things that his people should do. And he says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Have you ever done something good for someone and it just felt good? Amen? Jerry, you're rubbing off on me. Now I'm looking for amens. <laughs> but he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Well, how did righteousness begin? Well, it began by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly how it continues. It continues by faith in Jesus Christ. As we read his word and we learn about Jesus and how he thinks, how he acts, what he expects of his children, and we walk that way and we do righteous, we just, we, we fall in love with righteousness. And the more good things you do, well, well, that just felt good, right? I think sometimes we say that because we lack ways of better expressing it. You know, it just, it just felt right. Well, yeah, the Spirit was bearing witness with your spirit that you did what you were supposed to do. <laughs> and as we continue walking in righteousness, we become more and more accustomed to righteousness, and you develop a hunger for righteousness. You come to Jesus at first, and he saves you, and it so satisfies that you want to come back for more. I, I would like more of that sweet fellowship. And so we spend more time with Jesus, and then he says, well, why don't you, that person over there looks pretty sad. Why don't you go and tell him about the hope you found? That'd be really, really hard. And so we don't, and then we feel bad, and then we do, and we feel good. And this is how we often express ourselves, for lack of a better way of saying things. But in essence, what's happening, it's obedience to Jesus Christ and his spirit. And we're learning to obey the promptings of God's spirit. And the more we do it, the more addicted we become to it.